All right, so last time we left off talking about sets. We talked a little bit about um, the fact that we need some additional terminology, notation, shorthand, things like that to work with our sets. And we left off right here where we were describing um, sets in different ways. And so this set is a verbal description is what's given to us, the set of all whole numbers greater than 8 and less than 18. And we actually did, number one, a set notation for that. Does that look good? All right, so number two, what we're supposed to do is to do the set um, the, or the listing method for the set. So if you remember, what do we do when we do the listing method? We list all the numbers inside of curly braces. We still need the curly braces, just like on set, the set builder notation. So we start with the curly brace. What is the first number I need to list? It's nine, because it actually says it's supposed to be between eight and 18. So we'll start with 9. And what will be the last number I list? 17. 17. So I'm going to list everything from 9 up to 17. And that's the listing method for this one. <coughs> Clear enough? OK, let's try another one. OK, same directions. Um, we're asked to do the listing method, and we're asked to do the set notation method. And the description actually is given to us now a little differently. We don't have a verbal description. We just have some numbers that are listed there. But let me first point out that this is not quite the listing method, is it? What's wrong with this actually being the listing method? It has the ellipses in the middle, right? It has the three dot, dot, dots. So let's actually do them backwards order this time. Let's find out. Um, this is A, if you will, and this is B, the listing method. We'll do part B first. All right, so part B, the listing method. What am I going to do? Yeah, I need to list the numbers that are between the 6 and the 22, but they are multiples of 2, or they're even, right? Because the ones that are already listed here are just the even ones. So that's only the ones we've got in this set just sets description. So I need 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22. Okay, so I just fill in the dot, dot, dots. That's the listing method. All right, the other one then, the set builder notation, what do I start with? Curly braces, right? What's next? Always. Yeah, some variable, we tend to use x the most, and a bar, a vertical bar. So this is how it always looks. It looks like curly brace, a variable, a letter, and then the bar, okay? And then after that, we have to describe everything about this set that ex basically that makes it so that we don't end up thinking it's something it's not, right? So for instance, the number 7 is not in this set, right? So I have to make sure that when I describe it after this, I clearly say that I can't have that kind of number in the set. It needs to be very clear. The other thing is numbers like uh, zero is not in this set, right? So I have to describe the set in such a way that I sort of eliminate that possibility. So somebody tell me one thing that I need to say about this set for sure, and it, we can list it next. It doesn't matter what order I list these things in. What's something I need to say about this set? The numbers are even. It's even, okay? And um, along with it being even, it's also an even whole number. So let's just kind of combine those together. We'll put both of them down. So x is even. And then I can say x, and we did this last time, and we'll talk more about this symbol later. This is the epsilon e. Okay, so it's an e. It looks like kind of a curved e, but it's not a lowercase e. And then we put um, the notation for whole numbers down like that, right? It's that double lined w. Um, but this took care of my issue of it not being 7 in this set. Um, it also takes care of some issues of, for instance, like uh, 6.2 is not in this set, right? But I need to tell it one other thing. What else do I need to say about this? Right, it's between 2 and 22. Okay, so I can do that in a couple of different ways. One way to do it is to say, well, we'll put one of them in like this. We'll go with what Alice said. So if we say 2 to 22, and I put the X in the middle, what symbol needs to go between these guys? Yeah, I don't have just the less than symbol like I had on the previous um, slide. I have the less than or equal to symbol. 
So that actually makes it so that I can equal the number at the beginning and equal the number at the end, because 2 and 22 are in my set, right? Yeah. So what else could I do here instead? Uh, let me close this out with a curly brace. But what else could I do here instead of writing 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 22? What's another way I could write that? Any ideas? What about this one? What if I say that? That would work, right? Some of the time on my math lab, you're going to have to choose between solutions. So I want you to be aware of the fact that you may have been naturally inclined to the first one, but if you are choosing something that maybe is a multiple choice or a matching or something, what else could it have been written as? Make sense? And by the same token, it could be done like this. Right? That still excludes the 1 and the 23 that aren't really in my set because I've described earlier the fact that these guys are even. So any of those sort of components could go in that inequality portion of this um, description. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, we have one more in this sort of set of questions. It says describe the set, and it only has one method for us to describe it by. So we had an A and a B before. This is just an A. There's only one question. Set builder notation to describe this set, which is described as the set of all rational numbers. So set builder notation means you can start the problem automatically with what? <coughs> Curly braces. Mm -hmm. X and a line. So just the fact that it said set builder means you know you can do that, right? So even if you get stuck after that, we can do this part. All right, great. Next it says this issue about rational numbers. Well, we had a notation for whole numbers. It was the letter W. We also have a notation for rational numbers. It's not R. I know I would love for it to be R, but it isn't. We're going to use R for something else in a minute. It's actually, so we're going to put that epsilon E, it's actually a Q. So let's pause for a moment to consider why it's a Q. Does anybody know what a rational number is, what that description means? What kinds of numbers are rational numbers? Whole numbers are rational. That's some of them. But it's bigger than that. Do you see this word inside of the word rational? Ratio. What's a ratio? It's a fraction. All right? So fraction actually means we do what? What operation does a fraction indicate? Division. And what's another name for division when you're operating with it? What's that? A headache. No, that wasn't the one I was going for. Something else that might or might not have a Q involved. Quotient. Quotient. That's where the Q comes from. Okay, Q is for quotient. You guys remember the words product, quotient, sum, difference from addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Quotient, Q, that's why this is a Q, right? So that's why it's being used. It's because of that. Now, I want to, I think there's one, yeah. Okay, I want to do one more thing now. So go ahead and turn your page to the next page. You'll notice a couple of things. You'll notice along the left-hand side a series of different descriptions, including whole number and rational number, which we've already sort of touched on. You'll notice you've got a lot of blank space on the right-hand side, right? You guys are going to draw me a picture in that blank space. It's going to look an awful lot like the one I'm drawing. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to draw yourself a giant rectangle. Second thing you're going to do is you're going to take that giant rectangle and you're going to split it into two pieces. And I'm going to split mine a little bit heavier on one side than the other just because I need to write more stuff on the left-hand side than I do on the right-hand side. So I need some more space to write things. This division does not indicate that there's really more numbers on one side than the other. It just indicates that I have to write more on one side. Is everybody with me? Okay. We're going to draw the picture out, and then we're going to fill in all the details. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to draw a rectangle inside of that. And you're going to pause for a second. We're going to label what I've got so far. Okay. The small side, the small side of your picture are the irrational numbers. So just write in irrational. And we will write the types of numbers that go over there in a moment. 
And the bigger box on the left-hand side are our rational numbers. Okay, rational, irrational, we're going to fill them in in a second. Inside the rational number box, that box that's inside, I want you to write integer. And then draw another box. Inside this box, I want you to write the number whole. That should sound familiar. We've talked about that already. And inside the box that says whole, one last box that says natural. <clears throat> All right, so excluding the part that says irrational, what you have here is, in essence, the nesting dolls. You guys seen nesting dolls or whatever before where one of them is inside of the next one, right? That's what's going on with this picture. The part that's inside is itself a rational number. So whole numbers are rational. Integers are rational. Natural numbers are rational. Okay? It also means whole numbers are integers. Natural numbers are integers and so forth. Okay? They're inside of a bigger picture. Okay? So that's important to realize. Let's start with natural numbers. When you first learn to count, what number do you start with? One. You go one, two, three, four, right? This is what we teach our children when they're really little. They start to count, they start to count with the number one. Those are the natural, or sometimes <coughs> called counting numbers. So natural numbers are the numbers one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. And we can't list them all, I mean, right? Because they go on forever, indefinitely. All right, so then long about, I don't know, somewhere in kindergarten or maybe even earlier for some children, somebody does this to a kid, they say, I had three cookies and I ate all three cookies. How many cookies do I have left? And you need to have then the number zero. We need another ze number zero. And it wasn't one of the numbers that we taught our children to count with. Are you tracking with me? Okay, that number zero, just that addition of the number zero creates a new category. That's the whole numbers. So the whole numbers include the number zero and all the counting numbers we learned before. So whole numbers are zero, one, two, three, four, and up. Okay? And then we get awfully crafty and we say something to a child like this. We're going to the store and my daughter sees a toy she wants. It's always a toy or food, right, candy? These are one of the two things we have, right? She sees a toy. She saw a stuffed kitty at CVS last week. She just had to have this stuffed kitty. She didn't get the stuffed kitty, but she just had to have it. All right, so it's $6, right? And I say, well, how much money do you have at home? And this wasn't quite how it worked, but we're going to pretend. How much money do you have at home? And she says, $3. And I say, well, are you going to be able to buy the kitty? And the answer is no, right? And you say, because what's 3 minus 6? And what is 3 minus 6? It's negative, isn't it? And thus we encounter the concept of debt. Credit cards. This is negative numbers, right? All right, so we need those negative numbers, and that's what they represent for the most part in our society, is something where something is owed. That's how we use them. So integers are all the same numbers we had before, but with negatives on the front. So we have, for instance, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and, and we can go further down beside, you know, before the negative 3. We've got a dot, dot, dot over there as well. All right. There's one type of number that we use a lot that we haven't talked about on this slide, but we have talked about it. That's rational numbers. So what did we say rational numbers were? Quotient. Fractions, quotients, ratios, right? So we're talking about fractions. So what happens sort of in your development of numbers since as you're growing up is at some point somebody says to you, I have three cookies and I have two children. How many cookies does each child get? and we need something to be able to half that third cookie, right? So rational numbers include, again, all the numbers inside. They include integers, they include whole numbers, they include natural numbers, but they include more than that. They also include fractions. So you might end up with the number like one and a half. That's a mixed number. You might end up with a number that is a fraction but in decimal form, right? <coughs> Decimals are just, just fractions in a different form. So you might end up with something like a 4.78, right? That's a rational number. We could write it as a fraction. Um, you might also end up with something that's really ugly, like 436 over 213. Random number, right? It's still a fraction, okay, all the fractions. 
All right, the, the side that we haven't filled in yet is the irrational side. Does anybody remember from earlier math classes what irrational numbers are? What kind of number do you not see here so far? Square roots is a good example, but not just any square root, right? Because like square root four, that's two and that's a rational number. But square root of, say, 7, that'll work, is irrational. And what an irrational number really is, it's a number that we cannot write as a ratio. We can't write it as a fraction in closed form. You've seen another irrational number besides square roots before, too. All of you have. Do you know what it is? Say pi. Pi, absolutely. Now, we use a representation for pi, 3.14, or 22 over 7, but those are just estimations for pi. They're not really pi, right? Just an approximation. Pi is actually not able to be formed by a ratio or to have a decimal that stops, terminates, or repeats. Um, there's one other that you may have seen. It depends on what math classes you've had before. You may have seen the number E. Um, e is used in compound interest. It's used sometimes with exponential things. It's an exponential um, so you may have seen E. You may not have if you haven't, it's no big deal, but that is one that's also irrational. Now, just like when we did the others, all of these numbering systems have letter forms for names. So we're going to go to the next slide where you're going to fill on the left-hand side of that sort of area. The natural numbers, what do you think you might want the natural numbers symbol to be? N. N, the it is, it's nice, and it is, it's N. N with a double line, double line on the left, N. Whole numbers we've already done. What was whole numbers? It was a W. What would we like integers to be? We'd like them to be high, but they're not. Sorry. Uh, they're actually Z. Uh, it's Latin stuff, so that's where it's coming from. It's a Z for integers. We did rational numbers. What's rational numbers? Q. And um, real numbers is actually the R that you wanted before. There's actually two different ways to write irrational numbers. You'll see it listed very commonly in both ways. One of them is the I that we sort of thought integers would be nice to be. So you could see this listed as I, but as you can already see, if I double the I in the middle, it doesn't really look like an I much anymore. Um, and so there's another common notation for it. You might see R minus Q written out. So this would be the real numbers and remove. That's what subtraction is, right? It's a removal. Remove the rational numbers. So if you take the real numbers, you take away the rational numbers, you have the irrational numbers left. So this one right here is a little more common notation, uh, but occasionally you will see the I used. Okay? All right. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about is cardinality. Cardinality is simply the size or the number of items in a set. So you see the notation, you've got an N and you've got a parenthesis. The parenthesis is around whatever the name of your set is. Okay. So last time in class I talked about, very first thing we talked about was we created an, a set and the objects or the elements in the set were the members of my family. So if we were to put the N, and then in parentheses we put Dr. Han's family, and we close off the parentheses, that means count the number of people in this description. And the answer would then be four, because I have four people in my family. And so that's what this notation means. This notation doesn't mean who are they or what are the objects. It simply means count them. So you see the N, you see the parentheses, it means you're counting something. So let's try one because uh, these are pretty straightforward. Um, number four, the set A is described as the numbers negative three, negative one, one, three, five, seven, and nine. What is the cardinality of that set? There's seven, okay? Because we just count the number of items. There's seven of them. So N of A is seven. So that's nice when they're enlisting method, right? Now, number five is not quite enlisting method, but there are ways that we could do this one as well. This one's small enough that you could probably count it, right? Five, 10, 15, 20, and so forth. So that's one way to do it. How else could you do it? 
What's that? You could divide. What would we do? We'd, what would we be dividing and by what? Do you know? 50 by 5. 50 by 5. So 50 because we're looking at the numbers in essence from 0 to 50, and by 5 because these are multiples of 5, right? So either way we do that on this, we will get as it's Yale. Okay, what Yale said, there's 10 items, right? So the cardinality of this set is 10. There are two distinct kinds of cardinality. There's finite and infinite. So as you would expect, finite means you can count it, right? The cardinal number of set is a particular whole number. Infinite is a set for which the number of elements is so large it cannot be counted. So you might have in your mind the image back in um, Genesis where God talks to Abraham and Abraham doesn't have any kids yet and uh, he says, count the stars in the sky, count the sand on the seashore, that's how many descendants I will give you and Abraham basically says, I can't count them, right? That's uncountable, that's what we're talking about here, infinite, okay? So something that's too large to be counted. All right, so what we're going to do then is look at a couple of examples and make that call. Are they finite or are they infinite? Number six says identify as finite or infinite. We have the set 6, 12, 18, dot, 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 42. It's finite. And we could actually fill in the dot, dot, dot if we wanted to. We could count them and that would be fine and, and we can do this. This is finite. Number seven x such that x is a natural number greater than 50. This is infinite. Now pause for a moment and think with me. Is there a way to change the wording to create this to be finite? What would I have to do? Yeah. If I took the word greater than and I changed it to the word less than, it would still it would then be finite, right? Because natural numbers actually start at what number? 1. Now, if it said the integers less than 50, uh, that'd still be infinite, right? Because the integers can include the negatives. We don't have a stopping spot on the other end of sort of the number line perspective. All right, we're going to introduce a symbol that you've already seen. So the symbol is actually this one. And do you remember what that symbol meant? I've used it a couple times today. is an element of, that's right, Shane. So this is, is an element of. So for example, you might say something like two is an element of the whole numbers. All right, because it, it is one. So what do you suppose it means if I do this to it? I know, it's exciting, isn't it? So counterintuitive. No, it's great. This is exactly what we should mean by it, right? This means is not an element of. And, and we can do a very similar example to this. We could say something like negative 7 is not an element of the whole numbers. Because whole numbers are positive or 0. And negative 7 isn't. So that works. All right, so we're going to fill in a couple of blanks with the correct symbol. Either the element or not an element to make the symbol or to make the statement true. All right, number eight, seven blank parentheses, three, negative two, five, seven, eight. What goes there? Which one? It's not an element? It is an element, because we see the 7 in both sides, right? This 7 is over here. Yeah? Okay, so this one is an element. It is an item that is in the set that's on the right-hand side. So this has an element of. And number 9 is almost like a trick question, okay? What's different about number 9 than number 8? 
The three's in brackets, isn't it? And that actually means something different. Because you see, when the number's not in brackets, like the number seven was on problem number eight, it means this is an element. And then on problem number nine, when the number's inside of the brackets, it means it's a set. We've got a set, not just a plain old element, we've got a set inside of there. So we actually do not have a set on the right-hand side with a set three inside of it. We have an element on the right-hand side that has a three in it, but we don't have the element on the left. This is not an element. It is actually something else we'll learn about. I can't remember if it's in 2-2 two, two or in 2-3, called a subset, but it's not an element of that set. Now, if it had been written like this, I would be happy to put the element symbol. Okay, or let's say, for instance, it had been written like this. Okay, so it's a set of sets, right? That would be okay too. This is one of those notational things. Okay, it's a notational aspect to be aware of. Okay, I think we have one more item to take a look at, a couple more examples. <clears throat> the item for us to take a look at is set equality. A set A is equal to B if the following are true. Number one, every element in A is an element in B. And number two, every element in B is an element in A. And if they are equal, we use the notation that you would expect. We put an equal sign between them. A is equal to B, if this is the case. Okay, so we're going to look at two last examples. We're going to write true or false to, to describe whether or not uh, they work. Number 10, or number 10 says, 6 is an element of the set negative 2, negative 5, 8, and 9. Is that true or is it false? That's false, That's false right? We could change that one of two ways to make it true if that was what we were supposed to be doing. What's one way we could change that statement to make it true? What's that, Tyler? Yeah, we could put the slash through the element symbol. What's the second way we could change it to make it true? Yeah, put a six inside the curly brace on the right, right? That would work too. Either of those would be possibilities, sure. All right, number 11, x such that x is a natural number less than three. That's one set. The other set on the right-hand side is the set numbers 1 and 2. That is true. Now, you may look at the set 1 and 2 and say, well, I understand that set. This is a set with those specific numbers in them. But this description, you actually have to stop and pause and think, does that actually make it the same as these numbers? And that's what you want to know. Natural numbers start at the number 1, and the description said less than 3. So that's 1 and 2. 1 and two, which, which makes like this, right? One and two. All right, so that's a true statement as it is. <clears throat>